Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter Fifty. The Pursuit and Escape. Near to that part of the Thames on which the church at Rotherhithe abuts, where the buildings on the banks are dirtiest, and the vessels on the river blackest with the dust of colliers and the smoke of close built, low roofed houses, there exists the filthiest, the strangest, the most extraordinary of the many localities that are hidden in London, wholly unknown, even by name, to the great mass of its inhabitants. To reach this place, the visitor has to penetrate through a maze of close, narrow, and muddy streets, thronged by the roughest and poorest of waterside people, and devoted to the traffic they may be supposed to occasion. The cheapest and least delicate provisions are heaped in the shops, the coarsest and commonest articles of wearing apparel dangle at the salesman's door, and stream from the house parapet and windows. Jostling with unemployed labourers of the lowest class, ballast heavers, coal whippers, brazen women, ragged children, and the raff and refuse of the river, he makes his way with difficulty along, assailed by offensive sights and smells from the narrow alleys, which branch off on the right and left, and deafened by the clash of ponderous wagons that bear great piles of merchandise from the stacks of warehouses that rise from every corner. Arriving at length in streets remoter and less frequented than those through which he has passed, he walks beneath tottering house-fronts, projecting over the pavement, dismantled walls that seem to totter as he passes, chimneys half crushed, half hesitating to fall, windows guarded by rusty iron bars that time and dirt have almost eaten away, every imaginable sign of desolation and neglect. In such a neighbourhood, beyond Dockhead and the borough of Southwark, stands Jacob's Island, surrounded by a muddy ditch, six or eight feet deep, and fifteen or twenty wide, when the tide is in, once called Mill Pond, but known in the days of this story as Folly Ditch. It is a creek or inlet from the Thames, and can always be filled at high water by opening the sluices at the lead mills, from which it took its old name. At such times a stranger, looking from one of the wooden bridges thrown across it at Mill Lane, will see the inhabitants of the houses on either side lowering from their back doors and windows, buckets, pails, domestic utensils of all kinds, in which to haul the water up. And when his eye is turned from these operations to the houses themselves, his utmost astonishment will be excited by the scene before him. Crazy wooden galleries, common to the backs of half a dozen houses, with holes from which to look upon the slime beneath, windows broken and patched, with poles thrust out, on which to dry the linen that is never there. Rooms so small, so filthy, so confined, that the air would seem too tainted even for the dirt and squalor which they shelter. Wooden chambers, thrusting themselves out above the mud, and threatening to fall into it, as some have done. Dirt besmeared walls, and decaying foundations, every repulsive liniment of poverty, every loathsome indication of filth, rot and garbage, all these ornament the banks of Folly Ditch. In Jacob's Island the warehouses are roofless and empty, the walls are crumbling down, the windows are windows no more, the doors are falling into the streets, the chimneys are blackened, but they yield no smoke. Thirty or forty years ago, before losses and chancery suits came upon it, it was a thriving place, but now it is a desolate island indeed. The houses have no owners, they are broken open, and entered upon by those who have the courage, and there they live, and there they die. They must have powerful motives for a secret residence, or be reduced to a destitute condition indeed, who seek a refuge in Jacob's Island. In an upper room of one of these houses, a detached house of fair size, ruinous in other respects, but strongly defended at door and window, of which the house the back commanded the ditch in manner already described, there were assembled three men, who, regarding each other every now and then, with looks expressive of perplexity and expectation, sat for some time in profound and gloomy silence. One of these was Toby Crackett, another Mr. Chittling, and a third, a robber of fifty years, whose nose had been almost beaten in in some old scuffle, and whose face bore a frightful scar which might probably be traced to the same occasion. 
This man was a returned transport, and his name was Caggs. "'I wish,' said Toby, turning to Mr. Chitling, "'that you had picked out some other crib, when the two old ones got too warm, and had not come here, my fine fellow.' "'Why didn't you, blunderhead?' said Caggs. "'Well, I thought you'd have been a little more glad to see me than this,' replied Mr. Chitling, with a melancholy air. "'Why, look ye, young gentleman,' said Toby, "'when a man keeps himself so very exclusive as I have done, and by that means has a snug house over his head, with nobody a prying and smelling about it, it's rather a startling thing to have the honour of a visit from a young gentleman, however respectable and pleasant a person he may be to play cards with at conveniency, circumstance as you are. "'Especially when the exclusive young man has got a friend stopping with him that's arrived soon that was expected from foreign parts, and is too modest to want to be presented to the judges on his return,' added Mr. Caggs. There was a short silence, after which Toby Crackett, seeming to abandon as hopeless any further effort to maintain his usual devil-may-care swagger, turned to Chitling and said, "'When was Fagin took, then?' "'Just at dinner-time, two o'clock this afternoon.' Charlie and I made our lucky up the washer's chimney, and Bolter got into the empty water butt, head downwards, but his legs were so precious long that they stuck out at the top, and so they took him too. And Bet? Poor Bet. She went to see the body to speak to who it was, replied Chitling, his countenance falling more and more, and went off mad, screaming and raving, and beating her head against the boards. So they put a straight waistcoat on her, and took her to the hospital. And there she is. "'What's come of young Bates?' demanded Caggs. "'He hung about, not to come over here afore dark, but he'll be here soon,' replied Chitling. "'There's nowhere else to go now, for the people at the Cripples are all in custody, and the bar of the Ken, I went up there, and see it with my own eyes, is filled with traps.' "'This is a smash,' observed Toby, biting his lips. "'There's more than one will go with this.' "'The sessions are on,' said Caggs. "'If they get the inquest over, and Bolter turns King's evidence, as of course he will from what he said already, they can prove Fagin an accessory before the fact, and get the trial on Friday, and he'll swing in six days from this, by God!' "'You should have heard the people groan,' said Chitling. "'The officers fought like devils, or they'd have torn him away. He was down once, but they made a ring round him, and fought their way along. You should have seen how he looked about him.' all muddy and bleeding, and clung to them as if they were his dearest friends. I can see him now, not able to stand upright with the pressing of the mob, and dragging him along amongst them. I can see the people jumping up, one behind another, and snarling with their teeth and making at him. I can see the blood upon his hair and beard, and hear the cries of the two women worked themselves into the centre of the crowd at the street corner, and swore they'd tear his heart out. The horror-stricken witness of this scene pressed his hands upon his ears, and with his eyes closed got up and paced violently to and fro, like one distracted. While he was thus engaged, and the two men sat by in silence with their eyes fixed upon the floor, a pattering noise was heard upon the stairs, and Sykes's dog bounded into the room. They ran to the window, downstairs, and into the street. The dog had jumped in at an open window. He made no attempt to follow them, nor was his master to be seen. "'What's the meaning of this?' said Toby, when they had returned. "'He can't be coming here. I—I I hope not.' "'If he was coming here, he'd have come with a dog,' said Caggs, stooping down to examine the animal, who lay panting on the floor. "'Here, give us some water for him. He's run himself faint.' "'He's drunk it all up, every drop,' said Chitling, after watching the dog some time in silence. "'Covered with mud? Lame? Half blind? He must have come a long way.' "'Where can he have come from?' exclaimed Toby. "'He's been to the other kens, of course, and finding them filled with strangers, come on here, where he's been many a time and often. But where can he have come from first, and how comes he here alone without the other?' "'He—none of them called the murderer by his old name—he can't have made a way with himself. What do you think?' said Chitling. Toby shook his head. "'If he had,' said Caggs, "'the dog would want to lead us away to where he did it. No, I think he's got out of the country and left the dog behind. He must have given him the slip for the hour he wouldn't be so easy.' 
this solution appearing the most probable one, was adopted as the right, the dog, creeping under a chair, called himself up to sleep, without more notice from anybody. It being now dark, the shutter was closed, and a candle lighted and placed upon the table. The terrible events of the last two days had made a deep impression on all three, increased by the danger and uncertainty of their own position. They drew their chairs closer together, starting at every sound. They spoke little, and that in whispers, and were as silent and awe-stricken as if the remains of the murdered woman lay in the next room. They had sat thus some time, when suddenly was heard a hurried knocking at the door below. "'Young Bates,' said Caggs, looking angrily round to check the fear he felt himself. The knocking came again. No, it wasn't he. He never knocked like that. Crackett went to the window, and shaking all over, drew in his head. There was no need to tell them who it was. His pale face was enough. The dog, too, was on the alert, in an instant, and ran whining to the door. "'We must let him in,' he said, taking up the candle. "'Isn't there any help for it?' asked the other man, in a hoarse voice. "'None. He must come in.' "'Don't leave us in the dark,' said Caggs, taking down the candle from the chimney-piece and lighting it, with such a trembling hand that the knocking was twice repeated before he had finished. Crackett went down to the door, and returned, followed by a man with the lower part of his face buried in a handkerchief, and another tied over his head under his hat. He drew them off slowly. Blanched face, sunken eyes, hollow cheeks, beard of three days' growth, wasted flesh, short thick breath. It was the very ghost of Sykes. He laid his hand upon a chair which stood in the middle of the room, but shuddering as he was about to drop into it, and seeming to glance over his shoulder, dragged it back close to the wall, as close as it would go, and ground it against it, and sat down. Not a word had been exchanged. He looked from one to another in silence. If an eye were furtively raised and met his, it was instantly averted. When his hollow voice broke silence, they all three started. They seemed never to have heard its tones before. "'How came the dog here?' he asked. "'Alone, three hours ago.' "'Tonight's paper says that Fagin's took. Is it true, or a lie?' "'True.' They were silent again. "'Damn you all!' said Sykes, passing his hand across his forehead. "'Have you nothing to say to me?' There was an uneasy movement among them, but nobody spoke. "'You, that keep this house,' said Sykes, turning his face to crack it. "'Do you mean to sell me, or to let me lie here till this hunt is over?' "'You may stop here if you think it's safe,' returned the person addressed, after some hesitation. Sykes carried his eyes slowly up the wall behind him, rather trying to turn his head than actually doing it, and said— "'Is it the body—is it buried?' They shook their heads. "'Why isn't it?' he retorted, with the same glance behind him. "'What do they keep such ugly things above the ground for? Who's that knocking?' Crackett intimated, by a motion of his hand as he left the room, that there was nothing to fear, and directly came back with Charlie Bates behind him. Sykes sat opposite the door so that the moment the boy entered the room he encountered his figure. "'Toby!' said the boy, falling back, as Sykes turned his eyes towards him. "'Why didn't you tell me this downstairs?' There had been something so tremendous in the shrinking off of the three, that the wretched man was willing to propitiate even this lad. Accordingly he nodded, and made as though he would shake hands with him. "'Let me go into some other room,' said the boy, retreating still farther. "'Charlie,' said Sykes, stepping forward, "'don't you, don't you know me?' "'Don't come nearer me,' answered the boy, still retreating, and looking with horror in his eyes upon the murderer's face. "'You monster!' The man stopped half-way, and they looked at each other, but Sykes's eyes sunk gradually to the ground. "'Witness you three, cried the boy, shaking his clenched fist and becoming more and more excited as he spoke. "'Witness you three! I'm not afraid of him! If they come here after him, I'll give him up! I will! 
I'll tell you out at once. He may kill me if he likes, or if he dares, but if I'm here, I'll give him up. I'll give him up if he was to be boiled alive. Murder! Help! If there's the pluck of a man among you three, you'll help me. Murder! Help! Down with him! Pouring out these cries, and accompanying them with violent gesticulation, the boy actually threw himself single-handed upon the strong man, and in the intensity of his energy, and the suddenness of his surprise, brought him heavily to the ground. The three spectators seemed quite stupefied. They offered no interference, and the boy and man rolled on the ground together, the former, heedless of the blows that showered upon him, wrenching his hands tighter and tighter in the garments about the murderer's breast, and never ceasing to call for help with all his might. The contest, however, was too unequal to last long. Sykes had him down, and his knee was on his throat, when Crackett pulled him back with a look of alarm, and pointed to the window. There were lights gleaming below, voices in loud and earnest conversation, the tramp of hurried footsteps, endless they seemed in number, crossing the nearest wooden bridge. One man on horseback seemed to be among the crowd, for there was the noise of hoofs rattling on the uneven pavement. The gleam of lights increased, the footsteps came more quickly and noisily on. Then came a loud knocking at the door, and then a hoarse murmur from such a multitude of angry voices as would have made the boldest quail. "'Help!' shrieked the boy in a voice that rent the air. "'He's here! Break down the door!' "'In the King's name!' cried the voices without, and the hoarse cry arose again, but louder. "'Break down the door!' screamed the boy. "'I tell you, they'll never open it. Run straight to the room where the light is. Break down the door!' Strokes, thick and heavy, rattled upon the door and lower window-shutters as he ceased to speak, and a loud huzzah burst from the crowd, giving the listener for the first time some adequate idea of its immense extent. "'Open the door of some place where I can lock this screech in hell, babe!' cried Sykes fiercely, running to and fro and dragging the boy, now as easily as if he were an empty sack. "'That door! Quick!' He flung him in, bolted it, and turned the key. "'Is the downstairs door fast?' "'Double-locked and chained,' replied Crackett, who, of the other two men, still remained quite helpless and bewildered. "'The panels! Are they strong?' "'Lined with sheet-iron.' "'And the windows, too?' "'Yes, and the windows.' "'Damn you!' cried the desperate ruffian throwing up the sash and menacing the crowd. "'Do your worst! I'll cheat you yet!' Of all the terrific yells that ever fell on mortal ears, none could exceed the cry of the infuriated throng. Some shouted to those who were nearest to set the house on fire. Others roared to the officers to shoot him dead. Among them all, none showed such fury as the man on horseback, who, throwing himself out of the saddle, and bursting through the crowd, as if he were parting water, cried beneath the window, in a voice that rose above all others, Twenty guineas to the man who brings a ladder!' The nearest voices took up the cry, and hundreds echoed it. Some called for ladders, some for sledge-hammers, some ran with torches to and fro, as if to seek them, and still came back and roared again. Some spent their breath in impotent curses and execrations, some pressed forward of the ecstasy of madmen and thus impeded the progress of those below. Some, among the boldest, attempted to climb up by the water-spout and crevices in the wall, and all waved to and fro in the darkness beneath, like a field of corn moved by an angry wind, and joined from time to time in one loud, furious roar. "'The tide!' cried the murderer, as he staggered back into the room, and shut the faces out. "'The tide was in as I came up. Give me a rope, a long rope. They're all in front. I may drop into the folly ditch and clear off that way. Give me a rope, or I shall do three more murders and kill myself." The panic-stricken men pointed to where such articles were kept. The murderer, hastily selecting the longest and strongest cord, hurried up to the house-top. All the windows in the rear of the house had been long ago bricked up, except one small trap in the room where the boy was locked, and that was too small even for the passage of his body. But from this aperture he had never ceased to call on those without, to guard the back. And thus, when the murderer emerged at last on the housetop by the door in the roof, 
a loud shout proclaimed the fact to those in front, who immediately began to pour round, pressing upon each other in an unbroken stream. He planted a board, which he had carried up with him for the purpose, so firmly against the door that it must be matter of great difficulty to open it from the inside, and creeping over the tiles, looked over the low parapet. The water was out, and the ditch a bed of mud. The crowd had been hushed during these few moments, watching his motions and doubtful of his purpose, but the instant they perceived it, and knew it was defeated, they raised a cry of triumphant execration to which all their previous shouting had been whispers. Again and again it rose. Those who were at too great a distance to know its meaning, took up the sound. It echoed and re-echoed. It seemed as though the whole city had poured its population out to curse him. On pressed the people from the front, on, 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 in a strong, struggling current of angry faces, with here and there a glaring torch to lighten them up, and show them out in all their wrath and passion. The houses on the opposite side of the ditch had been entered by the mob. Sashes were thrown up, or torn bodily out. There were tears and tears of faces in every window, cluster upon cluster of people clinging to every housetop. Each little bridge, and there were three in sight, bent beneath the weight of the crowd upon it. Still the current poured on, to find some nook or hole from which to vent their shouts, and only for an instant see the wretch. "'They have him now!' cried a man on the nearest bridge. "Hurrah!" The crowd grew light with uncovered heads, and again the shout uprose. "'I will give fifty pounds!' cried an old gentleman from the same quarter, "'to the man who takes him alive. I will remain here till he come to ask me for it.' There was another roar. At this moment the word was passed among the crowd that the door was forced at last, and that he who had first called for the ladder had mounted into the room. The stream abruptly turned, as this intelligence ran from mouth to mouth, and the people at the windows, seeing those upon the bridges pouring back, quitted their stations, and running into the street, joined the concourse that now thronged pell-mell to the spot they had left, each man crushing and striving with his neighbour, and all panting with impatience to get near the door, and look upon the criminal as the officers brought him out. The cries and shrieks of those who were pressed almost to suffocation, or trampled down and trodden under foot in the confusion, were dreadful. The narrow ways were completely blocked up, and at this time, between the rush of some to regain the space in front of the house, and the unavailing struggles of others to extricate themselves from the mass, the immediate attention was distracted from the murderer, although the universal eagerness for his capture was, if possible, increased. The man had shrunk down, thoroughly quelled by the ferocity of the crowd, and the impossibility of escape. But seeing this sudden change with no less rapidity than it had occurred, he sprang upon his feet, determined to make one last effort for his life, by dropping into the ditch and, at the risk of being stifled, endeavouring to creep away in the darkness and confusion. Roused into new strength and energy, and stimulated by the noise within the house, which announced that an entrance had really been effected, he set his foot against the stack of chimneys, fastened one end of the rope tightly and firmly round it, and with the other made a strong running noose by the aid of his hands and teeth almost in a second. He could let himself down by the cord to within a less distance of the ground than his own height, and had his knife ready on his hand to cut it then and drop. At the very instant when he brought the loop over his head, previous to slipping it beneath his armpits, and when the old gentleman before mentioned, who had clung so tight to the railing of the bridge as to resist the force of the crowd and retain his position, earnestly warned those about him that the man was about to lower himself down, at that very instant the murderer, looking behind him on the roof, threw his arms above his head, and uttered a yell of terror. "'The eyes again!' he cried, in an unearthly screech. Staggering as if struck by lightning, he lost his balance, and tumbled over the parapet. The noose was on his neck. It ran up with his weight, tight as a bowstring, and swift as the arrow at speeds. He fell for five and thirty feet. There was a sudden jerk a terrific convulsion of the limbs, and there he hung, with the open knife clenched in his stiffening hand. The old chimney quivered with the shock, but stood it bravely. The murderer swung lifeless against the wall, and the boy, 
thrusting aside the dangling body which obscured his view, called to the people to come and take him out for God's sake. A dog, which had lain concealed till now, ran backwards and forwards on the parapet with a dismal howl, and collecting himself for a spring, jumped for the dead man's shoulders. Missing his aim, he fell into the ditch, turning completely over as he went, and striking his head against a stone, dashed out his brains. End of chapter 50